Okay, we're now recording. All right, thank you, Sam. So, uh, like Sam said, we're here to talk about LibGuides. And um, I'm aware that a lot of people use LibGuides and probably have used it more extensively than me. So, I definitely don't want to come into this um, trying to position myself as some sort of uh, LibGuide expert. But um, I've done some interesting things with LibGuides myself, customizing them, and I think that there are some technologies under there that um, that we all can learn a little more about and and just kind of leverage uh, when we're thinking of how to customize our own LibGuides. So I'm going to try to share my screen, which is always a challenge in Teams. Okay, so you should be seeing a PowerPoint. Yes, we're seeing it. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to go ahead and present then. So yes, customizing LibGuides by leveraging the included frameworks and libraries that are included in LibGuides. So the first thing I want to do is go over a little bit of an agenda of what we're going to look at today. So the first thing I want to ask is, what is a LibGuide? I think that we might have uh, some answers from some of y'all. So I want to kind of uh, poke your brains a little bit and see what comes to mind when you think of what a LibGuide is. Then we're going to use an analogy to talk about how LibGuides are uh, served up uh, from the web. Um, and it's going to be a cooking analogy. So hopefully you had lunch and this isn't going to just make you really hungry. Um, but that'll lead us into a discussion of like, what are some of these underlying technologies behind a LibGuide? And what are some of these opportunities that we have to, to use those when we're making our own customizations, just so we don't have to reinvent the wheel? Um, there's also a number of limitations that we're going to have to consider as well. Then we're going to go into um, some looks at some of those specific technologies. So that's going to include some of these things that you may have heard before, like CSS. Uh, we're going to take a really quick look at jQuery. We're going to look at Bootstrap. We're going to look at something called Font Awesome. Um, and then I'm going to show you some examples of where I've used some of those things just to kind of be a call to action uh, to get people uh, interested in maybe exploring and being creative and finding uh, fun ways to change their lip guides. Uh, and then, of course, there will be questions. If at any point um, there are questions, though, I'm going to try to keep an eye um, or feel free to interrupt me too. Um, because uh, there's definitely some technical concepts, um, but I tried to uh, keep um, to keep various levels where, of entry points where people can come in and hopefully get you know something out of this. So, so first thing first thing I want to ask is what is a libguide? So I've actually got a link here. And I'm going to Put a link in our chat. Okay. So if everybody wants to follow that link, it's going to ask for a password, and the password is UNCG. Don't tell anyone, it's very secure. Um, and then you can submit a response to what is a libguide. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up our responses. OK, so we've got a place to share curated research resources, a collection of resources, a curated collection of resources. Yeah. All right. Resources. I'm seeing resources a lot. OK. 
and I'll give like another minute. Anyone else wants to answer? I really like the user-ish friendly website tool, a uh, builder tool. Okay, I think that's probably about as many as we're gonna get here. Um, definitely seeing a lot about sharing information, <clears throat> curating it um, to provide resources. Um, and then we've also got this comment about the website builder tool, which is actually going to be related to my answer to this question. So thank you all for that. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay. So my answer to this question is, that it's a web application, it's a content management system, and it's a page builder. So you may have heard some of those words before, um, but I want to talk a little bit about why I think it's these things and uh, what that could mean for leveraging it when we're customizing. So to do that, let's introduce this analogy uh, that may make you hungry. So cooking up a live guide. So when you go to a restaurant, uh, there's typically three types of people. There's the customers, there's the cooks or the cooking staff, and then there's the wait staff. Um, you sit down, you place an order, the wait staff transmits your order to the cook, the cook prepares the meal, they receive it, bring it back to you, and then you can eat it or do what you like with it at the table. Um, so it's a basic back and forth to get your food. Um, there's something similar going on um, when you request a web page like a libguide. So if we think of the customer as the browser and we think of the infrastructure of the Internet as the wait staff, and we're not going to worry about uh, that very much. Um, and the cook as the web server. So um, we can kind of split up what's happening when we ask for a libguide in, into these different categories. So I said it was a web application. By that, I mean to contrast it to a basic web page. So in a basic web page, you have what's called static HTML. Now, static HTML is basically like you are the customer and you ask the wait staff, get me a, well, hopefully you don't talk that rudely. <laughs> You say, may I please have um, like a cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory because I know you guys serve it here. And then he goes back and then the cook says, OK, I've got that. I don't have to cook it. I'll just pull it out of the fridge and then you can bring it back to them. So it's already prepared. He's not changing anything or she there. There's nothing happening uh, to the food before it reaches you. Once you receive it, you can do whatever you like with it, though. You can chop it up or or eat it however weirdly you like to eat cheesecake. Um, but the cook is not actually doing anything. In that sense, the cheesecake is static. The other thing is that there's no database. So since the um, the cheesecake is static uh, or our basic web page is static, this this means that there's no there's no information that has to be dynamically grabbed from a database or, or storage somewhere. There's no ingredients that need to be grabbed um, with our analogy. Whereas with a web application, there's usually a database. Um, I don't know how it would work without one, um, and that's because of the dynamic nature of the HTML. So <laughs> relatedly, there's this one-to-one, one-to-many um, point that I want to make. 
So when you asked for the cheesecake, you requested it, the wait staff went back there, the cook grabbed one thing and brought it back. Your request was for one thing, you got one thing. With uh, one to many, with a, a web application, the idea is that you're requesting a um, a food or or in in this case a web page that has to be prepared from many different things. So the chef is going to be grabbing multiple instruments and ingredients uh, in preparing it. So there's not a single asset on the server that's going to be what you're requesting when you request a page as you would with a basic web page. And what this leads to, um, I think over time you've seen this historically too, uh, is that these basic web pages, which represent older websites in a lot of ways, can be kind of inefficient and repetitive. So it works well with our cheesecake um, because we're going back and we're just getting this one thing and 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 we're fine with that. Um, but if you've got a whole website, you're going to be reproducing things a lot, like a header. And the header probably doesn't change from one page or, or another. So if you keep this model of a basic web page, what you would have to do is go back into the kitchen and every single time someone orders some food, you're going to have to make every basic ingredient itself rather than uh, maximizing your efficiency by say cooking ahead a soup so that you can add it to um, a recipe at a certain point. Um, you're going to do those sort of things to be more efficient. Um, the other thing is because of it, uh, because it is repetitive, you're going to run into issues where when you need to make a change, you're going to have to change every single instance of it. Uh, so you see this a lot on websites with uh, the copyrights and the and the footer. Um, when a new year happens, you don't want to have to go through every single page of your website and change the date. You want it to automatically update. <clears throat> so that's where a web application comes in because it's dynamic in this way. Uh, it's going to use a database to store things. Uh, it's going to grab many different ingredients, um, but it's going to be efficient about what it grabs. Um, and so that's the sort of thing that that LibGuides is built on. It's a web application rather than this basic web page. Now, one thing they both share is JavaScript. Um, JavaScript is uh, something that happens in your browser, um, and it does allow you to make changes, and we're going to talk about it. Um, but I just wanted to, to show that that is the same uh, with both of those, despite these other differences that contrast them. I also called it a content management system, which is obviously a system that manages content, but um, there's a couple of important points about a content management system. One is that there's these two different views. So uh, typically you would call one a public view or it's sometimes referred to as a front end. The other is this administrative portal. It's a dashboard or a back end. Uh, so with LibGuides, you see this um, with the LibApps administrative dashboard. You go in there to, to create your LibGuide. You have to log in. Uh, it's not public um, or anyone would be able to change your LibGuide. Um, and so you see this with the content management system where there's these two different views. I personally don't think back end, front end is a good way to refer to it because uh, you can get it confused with uh, whether or not you're talking about a server, which is often also called a back end, and then front end being anything in your browser. Um, so <clears throat> I would keep that in mind. I like dashboard personally, but um, I'm not going to force anyone to use that. The other the other thing is uh, these administrative portals. Um, they're secure. Not they're not public, right? Uh, that this is where you're going to create all all the site content that you see in the public view. This is where uh, you actually are going to build your your libguide. So you're you're familiar with it if you've made a libguide. Um, but this is this is what this is how a content management system would work. Uh, any of the changes you make in that portal 
is ultimately going to be stored in a database um, so that it can later come out dynamically. And then third, someone hinted at this uh, earlier, but uh, LibGuides is not totally, but in a large way, a page builder. So a page builder is an in-browser editor. Uh, it's visual or graphical, and it's inside of the dashboard of the content management system. So you log in to uh, Lib Apps to edit your, your LibGuides, and um, a large part of what you're going to be doing is messing with this page builder. There are some other things, but uh, for the most part, it's it's that. So with a page builder, you used to see what's called a WYSIWYG, which just means what you see is what you get. It looks like a word processor or a notepad. Um, it allow you to bold and underline those sort of things. But now you, you've started, we started to see more uh, visual uh, components that can be laid out um, and, and changed as far as their order. Um, and they typically are things like links or an image or some sort of basic piece of content. And um, LibGuides is kind of in between. So it relies heavily on, it, on its WYSIWYG editor. Uh, but it also has the components for uh, layout and uh, you know link components, link groups, those sort of things uh, that you can adjust when you're building your page. So real quickly, and I know this is a lot of jargon, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make it uh, as as simple as possible here, but just so we're on the same page. Um, when we're talking about HTML, that's hypertext markup language. So it's not a programming language. It's a semantic markup language. It's like XML, um, and it uses predefined tags, uh, like you can see on the screen uh, with the P, uh, to hierarchically describe content. So the, the hierarchical nature of HTML is important. Uh, you don't want to uh, have some sort of subheading as your uh, main heading that's supposed to represent the entire site because that's going to confuse uh, Google for one, but also probably people using it. Um, so that's what HTML is. It, again, it's not a programming language though. Um, the next concept, concept I want to talk about is the DOM or the document object model. So this one you may have not heard. Uh, but going back to our analogy here. Yeah. Um, when you've ordered your food, it's the way staff has brought your order, the cook has prepared it, it's coming back to you. Um, once you get it, you can kind of do what you want with it, right? Like you could deconstruct your burger, you could eat it in, a, in your own unique way. Um, but you have to change what he brought you. So the way that works is with the document object model. It's an abstraction of the HTML that you've received so that the browser can actually create the web page that you're seeing. And it's an object, so it can be manipulated. And so that's going to be important with JavaScript. So back to this. Yes, so it can change states, and it's a live representation of the website. And when it changes, uh, it's not actually changing the HTML. There's nothing being sent back to the server that says change this. Uh, it's just for that user in their browser. Uh, the next concept is CSS, which we're going to talk just a little bit about. Um, but that's cascading style sheets, and it is neither a programming language or a markup language. Um, it is basically a way to separate out the styling of HTML, which initially was done in HTML, uh, but it was outside the scope of that standard. The, the CSS rules are a way to style your HTML, basically. So 
it's going to be a list of selectors. There's going to be rules of precedence, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. The next thing is JavaScript or JS, which is a programming language. We finally got a programming language. Um, it's the browser side one. So this is common to web applications, but you can also see it in a basic web page because JavaScript is just going to be sent along with the HTML, and then your browser actually executes um, the programming language on your end when you're looking at the web page. This is how you're going to manipulate the, the DOM or this abstraction of what the web page is. And then a few last things, and then and then we'll move on from terminology. Um, jQuery, of, often represented by the, the money sign, is a JavaScript library. So it's not JavaScript, and it's not included automatically in your browser. So you have to include a script to use it. But if you do use it, you get some advantages because it's a shorthand and you can do some really unique things. Oh, well, not unique, but um, you can do things in an effective way. Uh, so consider these two expressions. Uh, so the first one we have is JavaScript. We're referring to the document, which is the document object model. Um, and we're saying get this element by its ID, and then we're passing the ID and saying it's my element. In jQuery, we can do the same thing much in a much shorter way. We just do the money symbol hashtag my element in uh, parentheses and um, parenthetically. So it's often easier to use jQuery once you've learned it to do a lot of JavaScript stuff. The other thing is Bootstrap. It is uh, considered a framework because it's got JavaScript. It's also got styling. It's got ready-made components. Um, you don't get it out of the box either. It is uh, something that you have to include a script and a style sheet before you can use it. Um, but it's, I'm pretty sure, the most popular one um, of all web frameworks. And it was a, developed by Twitter originally. Uh, so you may recognize some similarities with that. Well. I don't know anymore, but uh, there used to be similarities, um, but that may change. So <clears throat> the last thing that we're going to touch on uh, with definitions is Font Awesome. Font Awesome is a ready to use out of the box font icon set. Uh, this allows you to uh, create UI components. So Lib LibGuides uses Font Awesome to create uh, the different menus uh, the icons in the menus and stuff you see in the dashboard uh, of LibGuides. And it just allows you to make things more visually interesting in some cases, but also informative. It, sometimes an icon can let you know that a page is going to open up in a new tab or can actually convey some information. Um, but typically it's, it's decorative. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about it because it's used in LibGuides. So here are the underlying technologies at last. We've got HTML, which is a markup language again. Uh, we've got PHP, which we haven't talked about and we're not going to worry about. It's there. It's what the chef is doing. Um, but it's pre-processing. It's not something that we're going to be able to uh, write or use at all uh, when we're customizing LibGuides. The other thing is CSS. Definitely CSS going on, and we can add our own CSS. We've got JavaScript, and we've got already, because LibGuides includes this themselves, you've already got jQuery, you've already got Bootstrap, and you've already got Font Awesome already included. You would normally have to do that, uh, but they're, they're there uh, working in the background, waiting to be leveraged. Um, I've included the uh, versions for those last three because um, since they're included by uh, LibGuides, they, they're stuck on the version that, that the developers of LibGuides have decided to use. In some cases, these are uh, fairly old versions, um, but that's something to keep in mind. So some limitations and opportunities here. So, with LibGuides, we can add HTML 
we can add CSS and we can add JavaScript to the WYSIWYG editor in the libguides page builder for a page. <clears throat> there, um, there's really no practical limit that I've seen uh, for adding it through a WYSIWYG, uh, but it's particular to a certain uh, guide page or a tab um, in your guide. There's also under um, some of the the general guide settings up in the upper right, a guide custom JSCS area, which allows you to add your custom JavaScript and CSS across the entire guide, which is uh, nice for when you need something to touch every page of your guide. Um, unfortunately, there is a um, limit on the amount of characters that you can add, so you have to be uh, a little judicious with uh, how you're going to uh, use that limited space there. And we can use uh, jQuery bootstrap uh, within the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that we're adding uh, in those areas. So those are all great opportunities for us to get in and, and start making customizations uh, using those technologies. Again, we have no control over the PHP. We don't know what it is. Um, in a lot of cases, that's for security reasons. If you're passing important information, uh, you don't want to send it to a user. Um, so <clears throat> we're not going to be able to to make any uh, PHP code. And again, the uh, HTML and CSS and JavaScript are are standards and they're included uh, in your browser, so they're always necessarily the latest versions, whereas with jQuery, Bootstrap, and Font Awesome, these you have to be wary of the versions because uh, they are older and they get stuck in time. Um, and if something changes, you've got to make sure you're looking at the right version. So that's a that's going to be a limitation for us, especially with uh, Bootstrap. So CSS, again, you can add it uh, to the WYSIWYG editor or you can add it to the entire guide through your custom JS and CSS area of the page builder. Um, when you do add it, you're not creating a uh, a style sheet itself, you're going to be adding it within an HTML tag that's called style. Um, so that there's going to be an opening style tag and a closing style tag, and all your CSS is going to go into uh, those tags. I've got uh, some links here to some some things to help you with your CSS. So one thing that I really like is the W3 tool. So the W3 tool allows you to use your URI or a file, or you can just directly input uh, CSS, and then you can check it and it'll tell you, oh, you've made a mistake here. And uh, this is from the W3, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. And uh, so it's rather official, I guess, as those things go. Um, but it, it's very helpful. I definitely used it a lot when I was uh, first playing around with CSS. Um, and speaking of W3, there's more that you can learn uh, other than just validating. You can come to their W3 schools, which I've included a link to a number of examples um, that you can use to get uh, some inspiration. And speaking of inspiration, I like CS Tricks. So CS Tricks uh, is basically a blog that talks about how to use CSS in creative ways. Um, you can use Stack Overflow. You can use some of these more um, like question answer based things, but uh, people aren't always very nice. And um, sometimes the answers aren't as, as well laid out as it is with uh, anything you're going to find on CSS tricks. So I, I won't put that out there because I've gotten a lot of inspiration from CSS tricks. So <clears throat> when you're using CSS in in the style tags, uh, there's a couple things that you need to consider. There's your selectors, so you can select for an ID. Uh, so if an HTML element has an ID, 
uh, that selector will be targeting it. Uh, the same goes for a class. And then there's also types, which is just the type of HTML element itself. Those selectors will help you target, but then there's also rules about whether or not what's being targeted uh, is affected by one rule or another rule that also targets it somewhat. Um, so by that, I mean, um, there are a number of rules when you're trying to decide what style is going to actually apply. Uh, so there's the weight of selectors. An ID is always going to be greater than a class, is always going to be greater than a type. So if you try to style an image, um, but you also have another style that's for a specific image, which has the ID footer logo, then the precedence is going to be on the style um, that's defined towards the ID rather than the type. The number of selectors is also going to be weighed. So if you've got two IDs or two classes targeting um, an element for a style versus one, the two is always going to win. And then uh, you've got your order of selectors. So uh, if you had the same CSS repeating itself with one change, the second instance of it would actually overwrite the first one. So it's that one kind of is intuitive. And none of that sounds very fun, but there is a nice little uh, infographic that that I've seen that, that I've always enjoyed is called specificity. You're trying to figure out the specificity of your styles and it does it with fish. So <laughs> we've got, I don't know why, I, I really like the, the icons here. Um, this is kind of showing you how things can get more specific. And so styles can become um, harder to override. Uh, which could actually be a problem in itself. So we've got our universal selector has no weight, but it would apply to everything across the board. And then the plankton, they represent our type. They don't have much weight, but if you have more of them, it will lend weight versus a lower number of plankton. And then the same with the fish, which are our classes. And then the sharks are our IDs. <clears throat> and then this also also shows two uh, kind of exceptions here. So if you have styles that are inlined on a meaning it's it's in the HTML itself rather than in the style sheet um, or the style tags, then that's always going to take precedent over even an ID. Uh, it's literally on the it's written on the element. Um, it's probably meant for it. Um, and then similarly, there's something called important that you can add after any um, style and it basically overrides everything. But if you need to override an important, that's going to be very difficult. You're going to have to use an important and consider how many fish or plankton or sharks you have. <clears throat> so generally, you don't want to be over specific. So <clears throat> this is how that looks. You've got your style tags, you've got a selector, and then you've got in curly brackets a declaration, which is going to include property values um, separated by a colon and ending with uh, a semicolon. Um, with all of this, the punctuation is essential. You have to get it right, uh, or the you know it won't be able to be parsed. Um, so on the right, we can see an example of this. It's a style for an image, and we're saying we want the width of the image to be 100 pixels. So what color is the text? So we can see that we have a uh, we have some CSS and some style tags, and we've got an ID targeting um, the color. And we're saying let's make it Rebecca purple. Um, then we're also looking at a uh, a class and its body text, and we're saying make the color light gray. And then we've got some plankton. We've got some uh, just basic tags or types, 
and we're saying bodies and peas, those are going to be color white. So if we look down there, we can see a P. It's got the ID of my paragraph. It's got a class of body text. And then we can see what the actual paragraph is. So which one of these is going to take precedence? Is it going to be the last one? Is it going to be the one with more? Um, a higher count of objects? Is it going to be the class or is it going to be the ID? If you were thinking it's the ID, you're right. Just because it has um, multiple um, in the body P case and just because the body text case comes after doesn't mean that it can overwrite the weight of the ID. The ID is always going to be weightier. Therefore, even though those next uh, styles do apply to our paragraph, they never override it because it's not specific enough. So moving to jQuery, um, we can add vanilla jQuery very similar um, to the way that we were adding uh, CSS to a libguide. And we can use jQuery uh, or vanilla JS. Um, either way, since jQuery is already loaded, um, similar to the style tag for JS or jQuery, we're going to add a script tag. Now, if you get a style wrong, that's not normally going to cause an issue with your web page. But with JavaScript, keep in mind that you can definitely break the page builder um, and that could be uh, possibly something where you would have to get support to help you like roll back or, or get someone else to figure out what's going on with your JavaScript. So as a word of caution with the JavaScript, um, but yes, very similarly, we've got a W3 schools examples page where you can go down and see some of these examples and how they're going to work um, and explore. And then for jQuery, there's an entire website, jQuery.com, and they've got great documentation to help you start using, um, I'll immediately start using jQuery, basically. And just because I want to give out more uh, good spots for inspiration, I think CodePen, you can get all sorts of interesting uh, snippets of CSS as well as JavaScript uh, using CodePen. So, just do a quick search for something. Let's see, navigation. So you can see all these people prototyping different navigations. And then if you like the way one looks, you can you can adapt it and use it as uh, part of your own project. And then just really quickly with the jQuery um, or JavaScript generally, you're going to include it in the script tags like you see here. Um, and with jQuery, you normally do this function that you're looking at called jQuery document ready. So you're, what you're doing is you're actually grabbing the document object model that JavaScript normally uses. And you're saying once it's rendered, once it's ready, now we're going to do things. So <clears throat> what you can see in this example is that paragraph that we were styling with CSS and we're saying actually change that to red. And now that's going to happen after all the CSS has been loaded so that we'll be able to override any of the styling um, because it is it's basically inlining it. But that this is a basic example of how you could start using uh, jQuery. But <clears throat> Bootstrap kind of shows you that you don't have to reinvent the wheel with these things. You can get HTML, CSS, and JavaScript all together, ready to go. Um, and that can just make things speed up the development process of what 
what you're doing on your uh, libguide. Uh, one thing to keep in mind uh, with libguides, though, is that it's using uh, version three, uh, which bootstraps already on version five. So it's it's fairly old and it's common to make the mistake of finding a good example and it's a bootstrap example and you go to adapt it for your own purposes and then you find out it's the wrong version. Um, so be aware of that. You want to make sure that you're always looking at the right, the right version here, which with bootstrap is 3.4.1. And so I've got a link to documentation for that. And you can see, especially some of our components here, you can see things like panels. So if you want a basic panel, panel with a heading, that's exactly what you're going to use. And the classes have already been defined. The styling, the JavaScript that's going to target it, it's all there uh, ready for you to adapt. So this is an example of how that could look. So on the left, we have some basic uh, HTML. So this is an unordered list uh, with three list items, and each of these is going to have a link in it. Um, but it looks like a menu, and we want to make it a menu. So with Bootstrap 3, what you can do is just add two classes here. You can add to the um, outer unordered list. You can add nav and then another class of nav dash peels. And then since it's a menu, one of them is going to be active. You're going to add a class of active to the list item that's active. And those little changes can take a basic HTML unordered list like the one on the left, and it can style it and make it look nice um, like the one on the right. And if you if you like the way that an unordered list looks out of the box, then then that's fine, um, but this does kind of give you a, a sleeker look in a lot of ways. And then <clears throat> lastly, I want to talk about Fawn Awesome. And Fawn Awesome might be a, a really good entry point for some people um, because there's not going to be a lot of setup and uh, you can really get some results further, fairly quickly. Uh, so Web pages, like we said, normally use a lot of icons to communicate uh, visual information. Um, Lib, Lib apps itself uses icons to communicate how to use its menus, uh, whether or not it's a drop down, little arrow, the hamburger icon for menus. Um, but with any imagery finding and making sure that it's attributed and whether or not you have copyright for it. It's not a simple process when you've got a lot of icons. Uh, so this is a great way to just get a ready to go uh, icon set. It's got the license included. Um, and so that's why Lib Apps and Lib Guides uses Font Awesome. Or I assume that's why. <clears throat> Since they use it, you can too. So we've got a list of icons here linked. And of course, they're going to say, hey, you're using something a little old there, uh, but that's it's version 4.7. That's what LibGuides uses. Um, and you can see there's a ton of icons here. So if you said um, we're looking for like an accessibility logo, then we could find universal access right here. So it's showing you what that logo is going to look like. And then it gives you just a real quick uh, I element with the proper classes to get that that to load where it is in your HTML. So you can get that icon simply by using this in your in the WYSIWYG, and it's going to include things like ARIA labels, which is what tells screen readers uh, this is decorative, so it doesn't try to read it and, and make it sound weird. So it's it gives you accessibility as well, which is nice. So this is what it could look like. You've got uh, fa fa bars. Of course, fa is fun awesome. Um, and you can see that on the right. You've got the universal access, which we looked at, and you've got a lot of brands. So you've got YouTube, you've got Google, you've got Twitter, 
um, social media icons almost always there's an icon set like this being used um, for those sorts of things. So I, I really think this is uh, one of the technologies that people could very quickly start using um, if they wanted to. So I just want to give some examples uh, just as a way to show you what some of the things that's possible uh, when you leverage these technologies. So I've got my Jackson floor map. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to find a decent map online of the library. And um, what I did here was I just used some basic styling and bootstrap to make it to where we can use the tabs or the peels, the nav peels that we saw. And you can go through and show hide the different images. All the images are there. When you click on them, it just show hides the different images. So that's a basic example of how you could uh, really quickly set up something here is to get um, a couple of those components together, uh, make a few connections, and then you've basically got a tool. And then something that uh, something that I built um, for us so that we can look up topical um areas in the library of congress classification system uh, at least the outline is this and it's using uh, bootstrap out of the box so i didn't style uh, the way this form looks and i didn't style or create the way that these drop downs look that's from uh, bootstrap and i'm getting that just simply because it's coming through libguides i didn't have to add it it was there I just leveraged it. And then finally, something that's more stylish. I created a uh, sticky header with a animated CSS gradient that goes back and forth, giving you some animation there. Um, so that's a little more uh, like um, of an advanced application, but uh, it's definitely a um, a possibility that that you have here uh, when you're customizing and trying to make things have your own style or uh, you know the look that you're after. And I took a lot of time to get through that, so I want to make sure that I've got some time here to answer questions. My mind is so blown. I don't even know <laughs> what questions to ask. Uh, but does anyone have questions that they want to put in chat? Or um, you're welcome to unmute. I have a question. And first of all, thank you. My mind is also blown because I have hassled my way through it without going back to study. And so it's wonderful, Josh. Thank you. Um, if you had to remake. <laughs> a multi-tab libguide as it is the DMC. Would you start from scratch or would you, you know, to like to try to, you know, make it uniform in terms of color, font, all that. Mm. Uh, we have a lot of content there. Um, so what would you tell me? Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't reinvent the wheel uh, with any with anything, especially with if there's any time constraints on on making those changes. Um, consistency always looks good. I you know from a design perspective. So if you can get styles across the board, um, that's always good. Um, if you can maintain a standard with other libguides so that things aren't uh, totally different, that can also be an advantage. Um, but I wouldn't go down and start. Uh, styling all the paragraph elements or all the header elements, but probably some classes or some IDs for something specific on your page that you want to change the look of. Um, as far as the content goes, um, I don't think I could really give much of a informed opinion about how to how to reorganize those uh, without taking more time to 
to go into it and look at it. But, um, but yeah, I definitely wouldn't go overboard with uh, styling all the things. Thank you. Hmm? Any other or anybody thinking of, oh, I want to make something. Well, I mean, yeah. I want to, but I have to. Again, I learned a lot today, so I have to think about it. Yeah. All right. Well, there's always a. Um, um, Need that accessibility option. OK, so Charlie's saying this. We need to add giving consistent UX across the entire university library site is important. Need a renovation too. Yeah, um, I think the website's going to be WordPress eventually is my understanding, um, and there's probably going to be a number of page builder components for WordPress that I imagine they're going to use. Um, so. We do have some site wide styling applied. Yeah. So that's just to say that if you are attempting some styling and it doesn't work, that could be why it could be in. Um, it, it could be that our site wide styling that we have to have from the UNCG uh, level is um, kind of conflicting with whatever you put in there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, they are different, but uh, like Charlie's saying, Rachel, I think uh, the consistency is important uh, just because they want to go from the one from the library website to a libguide and back and forth. It needs to. It, there needs to be a consistency so that they don't get confused about where they're going. So I, on the one hand, it's weird to go from one website to another technically, um, and not let people know. But in this case, I think it makes sense because you're trying to unify it with the website. And Terry can probably tell you a lot more about that stuff too. <laughs> All right, well, if anybody starts to get an idea and wants to explore it more, I'm definitely happy to uh, talk with you more about it and explore how we could make it happen. Okay, well, Josh, right. if you sent, um, did you drop the link to the slides in the chat? Let me, I'm looking up, sorry. Um, I did not, but I can. If you don't mind, that would be awesome because then it's with the recording because the recording will be at the end of this chat in the channel. I'm learning so much. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to say thank you. Like I said in the chat, I've been a LibGuides administrator since 2010 and I didn't know about a lot of these things. I'm going to be playing with Font Awesome for sure. Oh, yeah, no, that's. Uh, that's a lot of fun. I use it to add like the little link icons. It just adds a little yeah, touch. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I've included a viewing link. So there you guys go. It's included with it. And thanks again um, for sticking with me through it all. <laughs> Yeah, and this was great. I just want to emphasize what everyone said. And just, uh, you know, the side note uh, that Josh also is going to be doing a research and application webinar um, on Halloween. Uh, so fun times uh, on the um, online federal depository. Did I say it right? Online. Yeah, federal. Uh, federal yeah. online depository. Did I, I, yeah, did that, I mix up the that works? That works. Uh, I learning, <laughs> or as Rachel says, the horror that is government docs. Uh, we'll see. We're, there's gonna uh, be some jokes. Like there, that. I, is there gonna be a spooky theme? Um, there's Josh a spooky asked theme. for it to be on Halloween, so I just assume there's gonna be some kind of spooky theme. Um, yeah. So if you're interested, um, of course, anyone can sign up for those research and application webinars, even though they're different than the ULBLC. Um, so you should come to those as well, since. Uh, Josh has proven that he's great at presenting on the stuff. Um, and I don't think, I think this is the end of 
what is currently scheduled for ULBLC sessions. So just a current reminder, a uh, friendly reminder that if you have ideas or, you know, you have a conference presentation coming up, I know NCLA is coming up. Um, and you want to like get some practice. If you have a student, a capstone student who wants to do one, uh, that's always a good friendly audience for us to learn about some stuff that capstone students are doing, um, GAs, uh, interns, uh, et cetera. Uh, we're all welcome in the space. Um, so just a friendly plug that you can just email Jenny or I if you are interested in any kind of, um, yeah, after the conference too. Uh, yeah, so anything. Anything. We're open. We are an open book. Any, Microsoft, if, you, if you're like feeling angry or not, you can talk about that. So we're, we're open. Um, okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Let's stop the recording. Um, stop the recording.